Cool. Everybody get beer and pizza? Mm -hmm. Yay! Um, cool. Question since we're talking about beer and pizza. Should I be bringing healthier options? No. That'd be good. No? Okay. no. Unhealthier options. Right. Healthier very pizza. pizza. <laughs> healthier pizza. The next pizza has to have a jalapenos on it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think we can arrange that. All right, good. I was just checking, you know, I was, I was thinking, man, I wonder if I should bring bringing a salad. It might, you know, but nah. uh, it would it'd probably be left untouched anyway, but we'd all feel good about ourselves knowing there was options. Um, if, if, if anybody hasn't um, uh, registered on meetup.com, please do so. Just the RSVPing helps out and, um, and planning ahead. Uh, I'm Ben Rodriguez, most of you know me. This is Carlos Camarillo, um, my co-organizer. Um, sponsors uh, this month are Geekdom, obviously providing this lovely facility, and uh, Talogen for providing pizza and beer. And unfortunately, they had a conflict at the last minute, so um, uh, for good or for bad, I'm going to talk about their product a little bit. <laughs> we'll see if I can represent them, um, you know, make it worth, worth their uh, with their effort to, to sponsor. So um, so I'm talking about Talogen a little bit. I'll just touch on them for probably you know, four or five minutes. And then um, uh, obviously Doug is going to, gonna, he's the PTL for um, OpenStack Project Barbican. And he's going to do an introduction to Project Barbican. And pretty, pretty bright dude. He'll be able to answer pretty much any questions you have. Um, the pressure to talk then. Right? Yeah, no, no pressure. <laughs> Don't worry, we have more beer. <laughs> I, I've yet to see a, a question thrown at you that you couldn't feel, so I, I feel I feel yeah, like I'll take I feel like it's yeah, that's fair. Um, OpenStack Summit coming up uh, April 25th to 29th. It's in Austin. If you can go, um, uh, you should definitely do so. I won't be in the area for for some time to come. Um, I emailed out to the list a discount code. Um, it's like keep it local or something like that. Um, uh, if anybody didn't get that and plans on registering, I can save you about 15%. And I'll just send it out again. And then they also just recently started accepting um, single day passes. So if you, there's a talk, if you're if you're not going for the whole thing, and there's a talk that you want to see, um, a specific course, a, a track that you want to be a part of, um, you can go just for the day um, for the very low price of $450. <laughs> um, uh, May 12th, our own. Uh, Ed Lee will be um, talking about making your, your first OpenStack contribution. Um, Ed is a, a longtime uh, uh, OpenStack contributor and is contributing on behalf of IBM at the moment. Um, and then coming soon, we actually have an, an announcement. Um, I don't know, Carlos, I don't want to steal your thunder. Do you want to talk a little bit about the certified OpenStack administrator? How's everyone doing tonight? Um, Coming to the meetups, um, even last year when Ben was having meetups, uh, the open stack, the San Antonio open stackers, um, I had this idea that what if we started um, providing like uh, kind of like educational you know, segments towards a certification? And uh, recently, the uh, Open Stack Foundation came out with the uh, certified open stack administrator cert. So I talked to some of the uh, open stack people at work at Rackspace and. Uh, they thought it was, they think it's a good idea, you know, but we're still obviously you know, talking some more and getting it ironed out. To have um, basically the objectives in the COA cert to be turned into meetups and to drag it about like 10 months to be realistic and basically have it so when you come to a, a meetup, you'll be learning an objective, you know, parts of the actual certification test and at about 10 months, you should more or less feel ready to, to pay for the actual you know, certification. And this is all sponsored, you know, uh, by the OpenStack uh, Foundation directly, and uh, you know through Rackspace, and uh, we're going to be you know, providing the content, and they will be providing us with some of their actual employees who actually overlooked the actual exam to come up here and speak about each objective. So it's it's awesome. It's like you're getting basically they offer paid training that's like 20 grand or more, and by t by investing your time, you'll be getting um, some of them from almost all of them free for just investing your time. And that, that's basically, there's no time frame yet. We're trying to come up with something by June. And uh, that, that's where it's at. But if there's anything that y'all can bring up or suggest anything might help it be more accurate or accelerated, please feel free. You know, it, it's your meetup soon. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool to, uh, to begin building meetups around, uh, for a specific purpose around um, 
people attaining their certified Opus Act administrator. Um, so, so, so Talagent has a product called uh, OpenBook. Um, they basically do uh, cost and, and capacity management. Um, so basically, every, most of us are pretty familiar with OpenStack. I, I think at this point, like you have you have all of your your, your projects, Nova, Glance, Swift, Neutron, and so you have a lot of resources. You have tenants that sit on top of it. They're running their various workloads, and then you have your hardware infrastructure underneath. So OpenStack obviously has uh, Project Horizon, the dashboard, and the dashboard gives you a lot of information in terms of you know what you're what you're running at that moment. But if you want to go back historically and see what you have been running previously. You want to start doing some capacity planning. You want to get an idea of what your bill is going to cost that month. None of that stuff is available within OpenStack, right? You can you can you can basically um, try to store it all into a database and do something uh, custom. Um, a lot of the early on when OpenStack had just launched, I worked with a lot of hosting providers, and that was the big question. They're like, man, Rackspace um, basically gave away their secret sauce. This cloud infrastructure. Um, I'm an ABC hosting company. I want to run OpenStack and build my business on it. How do I build my customers? Well, you know, Rackspace's portal, that's proprietary. You have to build your own portal. You know? And so, so that, was the, that was the problem that they ran into. The same issue with large enterprises is how do I do build back, charge back, right? They run into the same, the same issue. And so that's, where, that's the spot that, that Talogen fills in the OpenStack uh, ecosystem, is they, they provide that uh, dashboard functionality um, to um, for for tenants to go in and capacity plan and see what they've been utilizing and administrators to 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 build a uh, price point on top of what they're utilizing so that they can issue invoices um, whether it's for you know internal IT issuing you know uh, chargeback invoices or for to actually end customers um, it's pretty straightforward to deploy it sits on a couple of VMs on the OpenStack infrastructure and it's deployed via heat template so it's pretty straightforward they have a um, um, and hopefully I don't mess up their uh, how they monetize but it's basically per node um, uh, annual uh, price that they charge I don't know what that what that charge is so it's going to be variable based on the size of somebody's infrastructure um, it's going to provide analytics capacity planning um, uh, there's there's notifications that can be set up if you think based on your, your the budget that you're you're putting in place um, you get notified if it looks like you're trending towards going over budget um, and then of course automation and users can can access it so basically the customer life cycle looks like this um, a, a customers onboarded um, it integrates with Keystone so all the authentication happens through there so so it's so it's gathering the data based on on tenant project um, so when somebody gets set up within within OpenStack they have access to their intelligent um, open book dashboard um, and then they begin begin measuring their usage um, a rate supplied by the, the company that, that uses Talogent to offer services cloud services um, and then usage is calculated and invoices are, are sent out all of it from within Talogent um, or via uh, the API, um, so people can continue using their um, their existing systems um, and just draw from from the Talogent, um system. This is just an example consumption report, and basically what it is is th this is done in one of their labs. So they have three different versions uh, of OpenStack running Ice House, you know, Kilo. Um, obviously, they're 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 doing this to to ensure you know functionality within um, for OpenBook, um, and then and then just the various you know months, May, June, July. Um, you're getting you know, memory, um, memory storage, um, CPU. Uh, I hit most of this stuff. The, the big thing of value here, so it works on OpenStack. It also works on VMware. So, uh, so it integrates with um, um, what, v, v, vCloud, vCloud director, vCloud. Um, so if you're running you know, peanut butter and, and uh, and chocolate in your in your data center, OpenStack and VMware side by side. Um, it's going to roll up um, uh, usage statistics uh, for you or or chargeback billing on those. But one thing um, that they're going to announce, and I guess I'm announcing early because he told me about it um, at the OpenStack summit, is that they're integrating with AWS now too. So if somebody's running a hybrid environment, um, 
you know, they can they can they can now pull statistics from you know their infrastructure and their and their public cloud um, all onto one dashboard. And this is basically you know how it looks. You have you have OpenStack VMware all providing input sources into OpenBook, and then uh, you get your data feed coming out either via the the, the dashboard as an administrator or or a tenant. Um, or via the API into whatever legacy invoicing system that you're currently utilizing. And this is how to get a hold of Talligent, um, or if you want to read additional information, or I can put you in touch with the VP of Business Development over there. John's a good friend of mine. So that is what I have. Uh, now it's your show, sir. So you wouldn't store the whole object in Barbican's database. You would store that in Swift, but you you can use Barbican to encrypt it. And there's some future, there's some work currently being done on uh, an encrypted op, an encrypted object store. Uh, so the way that uh, Barbican sort of works is everything or every secret is owned by a project, and this would be a Keystone project that we're talking about. Um, Barbican doesn't do any of its own off. In or off C, we defer all of that to Keystone. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to sit behind Keystone. If you're running some crazy cloud that doesn't have Keystone, you can, as long as you provide the request headers that we expect from uh, the Keystone middleware, it doesn't matter to us whether it's Keystone or not, as long as it looks like uh, it was processed by Keystone middleware. Um, and so basically, we, we use, uh, like any other project, we use software policy. For uh, controlling access to all resources. Uh, sort of out of the box, the policy you get covers all these rules. Uh, did you want to talk about the rules? Yeah, so 
There's service admin, project admin, creator, observer, audit, and pretty much service admin gives you every access to every single resource within Barbican. So that would be like a cloud operator, right? Like they, they're sort of god mode for Barbican and you're able to, to access everything. And then the project uh, lets you access and perform operations only at the, at the actual project level. So you're pretty much owner of all the secrets in this project, so you can do whatever you want within the project. Then there's the creator. So write, read, access to a secret. Then you have observer, which has only read access to the, to the actual payload. And then audit, which can only read metadata that's associated with the payload. So they can't actually get the key. They can just get uh, data that's associated with the key. So this is kind of the out of the box policy. Yeah, I see your question. Yes. Yeah. Just I'm trying to understand. So, I mean, uh, why I need to protect the keys? So maybe our, my employees has uh, private keys. So why not they protect their own key? I mean, why don't they protect their own key? Okay. So if you think about, you, you certainly could, right? The the purpose of bargaining is to handle a lot, a lot of keys, right? Uh, so if you think about like the Swift uh, encryption problem, right? So Swift really good at storing files would like to store encrypted files, right? Because security is usually concerned, especially nowadays, everybody's talking about security. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Swift wants to be able to say, okay, look, I use a unique encryption key for every Swift container that I have, right? And if I'm running a huge cloud, that's, that's one key per container, per customer, and I got a million customers, that's a lot of keys. Uh, and that's what Barkin's designed to do, is be, be able to handle keys sort of at that scale. Uh, good question, thanks. Um, so that's sort of how, how we control access to it. So in addition to secret, there's a couple of other resources we have. One of them is an order. Uh, for yeah. So, so yeah. Let's, so let's go through the, the little flow chart, right? So you're the client, right? You send, you tell Barbican, oh, like I want you to make a secret for me, right? And I want you to, you know, create this payload for me. So what you do is you just you send the you request an order to the Barbican API. So then that order is added to a queue, right? So once once your your item becomes available in the queue, it sends it to the Barbican worker, which processes it, and then it sends it off to your HSM or hardware security module, and that HSM will will generate that secret for you. So so that way the user doesn't have to you know find a way to come up with with a key or a payload. It'll be automatically done by the HSM, which generates a lot more entropy than it you were using just your regular hardware. Uh, yeah, one thing I guess I forgot to mention is there's, there's if you look at the very, very high level of Barbican, what Barbican can do, secret storage is one of the features, uh, certificate provisions in Tokyo about splitting the two into separate projects, try to, try to have a little bit narrower focus for, for what each piece of it does. Uh, but as of the Mitaka release, uh, Barbican does both of those things. Uh, so orders is the interface that you can use to either request a new encryption key or passphrase or something like that, or you could also request a new certificate through it, uh, which brings me to our certificate side. Uh, and so uh, certificates, I hope everybody's familiar with at least uh, Xbox One certificates as they're used in TLS. Um, like I mentioned, Barbican can connect as a proxy to a CA. Uh, we're working with people from Semantic so that hopefully someday we'll be able to order semantic uh, certificates through uh, the Barkin API. And uh, let's see, what else did we have on here? Uh, there's a couple of different ways of, of ordering certificates. Uh, there's a couple of modes we support. A lot of this API came along, uh, came a few years before Let's Encrypt. Uh, and so had, had that standard without, we probably would follow that standard. Uh, but for now, we have sort of our own our own API for ordering certificates. Uh, and then architecture. This is sort of the, the Barbican architecture at the high level. Yeah, it gives a little look at all the components that make up Barbican. So you have your clients, of course, which we'll discuss later on in this PowerPoint, uh, which you know directly interact with the Barbican API. And part of the Barbican API is Keystone Auth, plus any other middlewares we can put in place, such as like an auditing middleware, where we can get like notifications, you know, from whatever we did a post on um, this URL to create a secret, we we get all that. 
all that notification data are written to logs or written to, to messaging. Yeah, or in the own stack, I hear that's, that's a, a cool way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so we run, so the, we run uh, econ actually is, is what the heart of Barbican is. Yeah, so the at the time that Barbican was incubated into OpenStack, there was a big push for all OpenStack to adopt econ as the web framework. Uh, of choice. Uh, I, I found out recently that us and one more project is the only ones who are actually using the con. Uh, so, man, they're, they're so much for free conformity. Is that still, is, is Pecan still supported? Yes, so oh, and actually, Ryan Petrello, yeah. Ryan Petrello is an employee of, I want to say Blue Box, maybe, or I forget what company they work for, uh, but he hangs out on our channel. Specifically for any problem we have, he's like, he's like super quick to respond and, and very friendly about fixing any issue we run into with. Um, so yeah, as far as I know, it is maintained. Uh, whether that is the the, the open stack way to do um, your web framework, I'm not so sure about. Yeah, there's actually uh, if you go to the open stack Reddit, there's actually some uh, there's actually an article somewhere on there that talks about uniformity within open stack and it tells you. What web framework each OpenStack component uses, and what they're some of them are trying to move to different ones to try to keep it uniform, but it just kind of brings you a layout of how different each component is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, like you mentioned, to be able to profit, so orders is an asynchronous resource, and the reason for that is uh, if you think about like RSA keys, uh, those take a while to to create. Like if you just on the command line make a new RSA key. It's going to take a couple of seconds, that's a really long time when you're talking about a web framework. Uh, so we sort of do these things asynchronously. Uh, if you talk about provisioning a new TLS certificate, that can take upward of weeks depending on, on who your CA and his provisioning is and sort of what level of insurance you're buying from them. Uh, so if you want like an ED certificate so you get the little green bar, I think some CAs actually physically send a person to your office to make sure the place exists. So some of those things could take a really long time. That's the reason we have a queue. Uh, and so we use uh, auto messaging for our queue. So anything that auto messaging supports, in theory, we support as well. In practice, I think everybody just uses Rapid. Um, we've got uh, a worker process that reads off the other end of the queue. Uh, and this is the process that, that either creates new secrets that you've requested, or it talks to the CA uh, on your behalf to say, hey, make me a certificate. Um, and then every so often checks with the CA and say like, hey, you have my certificate ready, you have my certificate ready. Um, or just have a status, uh, so the worker or someone can update my status. And you fail, you don't know, like, yeah, um, to your CA or secret. All that, all that good stuff. Um, we have a pluggable, what we call a pluggable crypto backend. And so for an employer, you get a lot of flexibility on what you choose to be a crypto backend. Uh, if you want really high security assurances, you would need something like an HSM, which is a hardware security module. Anybody not familiar with HSM? So, so, no? Uh, so uh, a commercial HSM is about uh, a one you rack, you, you rack it like you would a server, you connect it to your network like you would a server. Uh, but it doesn't run an operating system, it runs some custom firmware uh, that your vendor provides. Uh, and it's like a super secure thing, right? And the real fancy ones even have like a little vial of acid inside. So if somebody tries to crack it open, it'll drop the acid on the chip and like melt away all the stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, those are really fancy and really expensive. The ones that we use at Rackspace are uh, SafeNet Luna SAs. Uh, those are relatively cheap compared to other ones, but they're still really expensive. They're about $15,000 a pop plus a $10,000 a year service contract for a minimum of three years, so they, they can be pretty pricey. Uh, but they provide some really cool stuff, like really fast crypto. Um, they can do encryption, yeah, I guess you do encryption on the network, and the key never leaves the HSM. Um, we've also got uh, sort of, the, the way that we interface with these devices is through uh, standard interfaces, so it, it, they're sort of vendor agnostic. Uh, there's a couple of competing standards. There's the PKCS number 11 standard, which we use for the Safe and Lunas. There, there's a competing standard. They're uh, both actually owned by Oasis now, uh, called the KMIP standard. And uh, they, other vendors make HSMs that speak that protocol instead of PKCS 11. Uh, and then we've also got support for uh, a system named DogTag. Uh, 
uh, which we'll talk about. And um, for database interactions, we use uh, SQL Alchemy. So pretty much any SQL database is compatible with it. So you can run Barbican with a SQLite, you know, flat file if you want, you know, for development, or you can end up to MySQL or Postgres, you know. For MariaDB, regular cluster as well. Do you have any, <laughs> have you ever read that Oracle databases? Or? I have not read that against Oracle. In theory, it'll work. So whatever, <laughs> whatever flavor of SQL you like, uh, you should support. Um, so, sort of dig into the, the plugin system a little bit. There's two plugin types. I remember I said there's sort of these two high level things that Barbican does. Uh, so, we've got the, the secret store plugin, and that's what we're calling the abstraction that, that actually stores the, the data securely. Um, and then, sort of the other big class of plugins is the certificate plugin, and this is what tells Barbican how to talk to a particular CA. CA meaning certificate authority, the people that can be tell uh, we do have uh, another sort of sub plugin, if you will. There's one implementation of the secret store that does all the storage on the database, but then defers all the crypto stuff to one of those protocols I talked about earlier. Uh, and so the nice thing about this uh, database adapter, we call it the database adapter plugin. The nice thing is that it sort of uh, gives you unlimited storage for your HSM. One of the things that we find out after we bought these really expensive devices, is that the memory they have is very, very tiny. I think we, uh, we filled it up with about 100,000 keys, which at the scale that we want to operate was not really enough. Uh, and that's sort of how this, this database adapter came to be. Uh, so at that point, you're really only limited by how far you can, you can scale out your SQL database. Um, and oh, it and look to this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, with the plugins, are most of the plugins developed in tree, like publicly, or yes, do most yes. people do it locally and not share? So we've got, um, we've got for the secret storage, we've got three plugins. Uh, we've got the database adapter with, with the PKCS 11 backing it. You can also run the database adapter with a software-only crypto, and we don't recommend that because you don't get any of the security benefits from HSM. Uh, we've got a KMIP adapter that, that some folks at Johns Hopkins University are very interested in contributing to. Uh, and then we have the dog tag adapter that's uh, the, the one that's developed by Red Hat. And that's the only, the only three or four that we have now. Uh, they're all in tree. Uh, but we do have a process for like adding new, new things. If you yeah, can. I was wondering if about the process more like do if some company wanted to do their own, would they generally do it openly it, it, and, and as part of We would like that. Them? Yeah, absolutely we would like we would definitely accept it. We have sort of uh, the process that we've defined is you can request to say, hey look, I want to add a new plugin uh, for X device or that it works in, in this manner that none of the other plugins work in. Uh, and so then we, we would accept that with, I think we give them two cycles to, to sort of bring that up to a good maturity level that they can run anywhere. Uh, and then we also have a process for keeping plugins out of the tree if they, if they become unmaintained or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So we, we've got, uh, yeah, we, we're definitely open to more plugins if anybody's interested in developing a plugin. Uh, but the stuff that we have now is all in tree. I don't know of any, I'm, I'm not aware of any out of the tree plugins. Uh, if you will. Uh, as far as the certificate plugin, uh, the most complete is the one that uses DocTag. Now, DocTag is uh, sort of a self signed CA, right? So, if you if you don't mind running no private PKI inside your org, then DocTag would be a, a great thing to support it. We don't have any public CA support yet, uh, but I did mention we're working with Semantic. Hopefully, sometime in the future, the Semantic plugin will be ready for use. Uh, and there's uh, in the mailing list, a lot of people have asked about like doing Let's Encrypt plugin. I think it would be awesome. Uh, Raxos is not paying me to make a Let's Encrypt plugin, but <laughs> if anybody else wants to, uh, I think that would be super cool. <laughs> um, uh, some other resources we've got that we want to talk about, we've got containers. Uh, they're basically just a, a logical grouping of uh, secrets. We do have uh, type containers, uh, and we've got like generic certificate that I say. The idea here is that if you think of an RSA key, it has a public part, a uh, private part to it, and optionally you can have a passphrase that is protecting the private key. Uh, and so if you store those in Barbican, those would be three different secrets, right? 
Uh, and so an RSA tag container lets you associate those and, and very specifically say, like, this is the public key, this is the private key, this is the optional passphrase, and stuff like that. Uh, and then we also got a generic container that you sort of use as a, as a name uh, or as a key pair value, like a, like a key value pair. Can you put a container in a container? I don't think we can yet. Yeah. No, so the, the picture's a little misleading there. <laughs> um, some other stuff we've got, uh, we've got built-in quotas. Like I said, we do want to operate bar at a huge scale. Uh, and so quotas are pretty interesting. Uh, what can we do with quotas? So, okay, so there's a lot of reasons for quotas, right? Charging people, making sure that people don't blow up your database, I guess. Right, because if there was no quota, I can just make a billion secrets. I have a script that does it, fill up the database, and you know, then all the servers. So you need some way to kind of limit that. And you also want to know how to charge people, right? You also want to say, look, you know, I'm going to give you the plan that's you know the $10 a month plan, and you get like 100 secrets. And if you want to upgrade, you know, you kind of go from there. There's different plans, so it allows us to build a good model for a billion. Um, yeah, I mean, those are the, the big reasons for that. And you can pretty much put um, a quota on every single uh, barbican. So if you're on, you mentioned the, the God mode rule earlier. Uh, so like if you're an operator, you can have your, your service people like on the phone, like somebody calls like, hey, I ran out of space. Well, yeah, I can update your quota. And so quotas are, are able to be set at the project level. So if you've got like like a customer that needs a lot of storage, you can, you can raise the quota just for them. Yeah, and there's talks of wanting quotas at the domain level. So and there may be some solution where Keystone is implementing, you know, hierarchical projects. So projects within projects. So there there might be a way to just, you know, put the project to be the top level project and that way it'll make all the project it'll it'll make everything inside of it only be able to have that, that <coughs> quota. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is we uh Arby is currently not domain aware. So we don't really do anything fancy with the domain. I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll see it, and that's great. But everything sort of scoped at the project level. Yeah, and, and domains is being deprecated either way in Keystone. So, uh, well then maybe we'll so that as we're going to. So maybe if I can can improve like project based quota, like you know, top project uh, have like top quota, and then that handles all sub you know project quotas, mm -hmm. like including. This before. It was the argument that domain is really just a top level project. Yeah, yeah I've heard that. Interesting. So I think they just implemented it and we're talking. I think interesting. Uh, there's, there's a couple other things that we're not going to dive in too deeply right now. Uh, there's ACLs, uh, and this was, uh, I was hoping it would be. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Question? Just to understand from this thing. So, uh, so the, the X, XM, the hardware. Uh, HSM, yeah. yeah. So this uh, make sure that this is a uh, set at rest. But but in, in that case there is Q or there is some other point when you move the uh, key around. So it does not provide uh, security for that part, right? So every in a secure deployment of Barbican, you will have TLS encryption in between every node that talks to another node. So the, the idea is that like at no point should the secret be in plain text anywhere in the network. Yeah, good question, I like that. A uh, couple other things we, we're not gonna get into deep into, uh, there's ACLs. We had to add this to our API to work around uh, a uh, Keystone location. There's no way for Keystone to be able, or through the Keystone model, be able to say, like, I want to let somebody else that's not a part of my project uh, to give them access to a secret. Um, there's ways to do similar things, but uh, some contributors were not happy with, with the Keystone models, uh, so we got, we, we sort of got talked into adding ACLs to it. Um, not a big fan, uh, if you can't tell, I'm not a big fan of that feature, but it's there. Uh, I'm hoping at some point we'll be able to deprecate it. Yeah, and well, I don't know about any deprecation anytime soon because Swift actually wants to take uh, for Swift encryption. I just had a call today, and they actually want the ACL feature of Barbican because Swift themselves doesn't, they don't all run on Keystone deployments. They can also have temp URL, they can also have an, an ACL. 
for that. So, so under like uh, ACL based off the Keystone user ID. So if it's the same in Barbican, then they can access that secret. If you have access to an object, you can also access the secret of the ACL. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I had that thought of it. Maybe we won't ever get ACL at the same time. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's another feature called consumers, uh, and it's sort of like a like a one request set metadata and get the payload back. Uh, and the idea behind this is to enable other projects like Horizon uh, to be able to give you a warning of where your key is being used, right? And so one other project that's that's making a lot of use of consumers right now is the, um, the Neutron LDAS folks uh, slash Octavia. I'm not sure what name they go by, uh, but the 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 idea there is that when somebody provisions a new load balancer through Octavia that uses TLS termination, um, the Octavia system will be able to add consumer metadata to your secret so that at a later point in time, if you forget that you've got that running in a, in a load balancer somewhere, and you go to Verizon to delete it, Verizon will be able to look at the consumers and say, hey, are you sure there's this load balancer over there that's using that secret? Are you sure you want to delete it? Um, and so it, it's, it should be a pretty useful sort of um, feature for, for keeping track of where your key is, is being used. Okay, so let's talk about the clients that you saw in the architectural overview. These are the three main clients that we have to interact with. Barbican, you know, aside from doing curls and all these things like that. Um, so we'll go over Python Barbican client. So it's the standard uh, client. You know, like all the other OpenStack clients, you know, have the Keystone, Nova. So it's just your standard client for Barbican. <clears throat> and it does everything, you know, that the API can do. Um, and it also includes the CLI function. So you can type in Barbican secret store, and it'll, you know, create your, your secret, and you can pass in as parameters all the different items that you need. You can also uh, submit orders through the CLI, uh, so you can automate stuff like provisioning a new new key or provisioning a new cert and stuff like that. Uh, and then also whenever we add new features to the API, Python and Barbican client will be the first client to get those features as well. Uh, we've got uh, Python open we're part of Python OpenStack client as well. Uh, we have an entry plugin so if you install I think if you install Python Barbican client then that makes all of the all of the Okay, this is the one CLI. I'm thinking of one second. Okay, this is the unified CLI, and so if you have the unified CLI and you install Python Barbican client, then we have a plugin that plugs into the OpenStack command, uh, so that you can say OpenStack. I think it's secret right now, but I want to change that as manager. But the idea is, you would, you would, if you're used to using the new unified CLI, we have support for it. Use just Barbican. Uh, the cast line would be sort of that extra abstraction. Yeah, and you want to add, let's say in the future you want to add your own thing, but you also have customers using Barbican, you can just, you know, add your own thing into Castellon, and users can still, you know, do Barbican, and then you can, they can switch depending on where you want them to go. So uh, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the, sort of, one of the, I guess, drawbacks of Castellon is that it is uh, sort of one size fits all, lower common denominator, and some of the fancier features in Barbican are not available. For example, search provisioning is not a part of that line. It's really just store of retrieve keys. Um, OpenStack integration, just a, I guess a quick overview of what other projects are using Barbican. Um, Nova uh, already has like a key manager, and they're in the process of replacing that with Castellon so that you're able to use Barbican through that Castellon interface. Uh, same thing with Swift. Swift is, is currently exploring uh, how to do encryption in Swift. Like they have some really interesting problems uh, that they're trying to solve. Like how do you encrypt uh, a three gig file that system transit, right? And then be able to say like, oh yeah, they're running, they're running these in chunks and stuff like that. So it's, they have some interesting problems to solve. And as soon as they figure out that part of it, then they'll be using Castellan and Android and Barkin as well. Uh, Glance, uh, I, I think it's ima image signing. The image signing feature, they use uh, cryptographic keys to create those signatures. Um, they have their own abstraction of a key manager that is currently being uh, changed into Castellan. Um, 
Cinder, I think uh, Cinder is the encrypted block storage yeah. that's complete. Uh, also currently integrating with Hasla. Uh Neutron LBAS, like I mentioned, they integrated directly with, with Barbican. Um, and that's the, the, their integration was completed Liberty, awesome. Uh, and Magnum is currently integrated with Barbican, but they are moving towards Castellan. They've got some, some pushback on people who want to secure their clouds without Barbican, which I don't really understand, but uh, it is what it is. I think it was Sahar also has it. Yeah, so it's got something in there. Yes. So like, in the case of Cinder, and then you mentioned Magnum, they're already integrated, why are they moving the castle on? Well, even if you said it was a least common denominator type of product, why yeah. would that sound like a downgrade? The, what I've heard from the Magnum folks is that there are operators that, that say, like, hey, containers is a new hotness. Magnum does containers. I want to deploy Magnum. Uh, and then they talk to the Magnum folks and say, yeah, you know, that's great, but we, we create all the secret stuff that we need to keep safe, and so you should deploy Barbican as well. Uh, and then a lot of deployers were going, well, oh, wait, I don't want to deploy two new projects. I just wanted to deploy Magnum. Never mind, I don't want to do it. Uh, and so that apparently they're hearing this a lot, and that's, that's what is prompting them to sort of add that layer of interaction in between them and, and us. Yeah, because they made part of it, they want to take time. I'm not understanding, I thought Castellan was a client of Barbican, so how does it do anything without Barbican? What's well, a generic, so I well, so those, yeah. Current so Castellan is an it's an abstraction, right? It's it's a yeah. it's a abstract base class, if you will. Uh, one implementation is Cast is Barbican. There's uh, folks at Johns Hopkins are working on a, an implementation that will speak to an HSN directly. Wow. Now this works for them because they run really tiny clouds and they like, they don't care about the, the the storage constraints of an HSM. Um, Magnum just wants to do it so people stop complaining about having to use Barbican, really. But uh, they're still trying to figure out how to implement something that is still good enough to call secure. I, I think they're having it. Yeah. There's an interesting thread uh, in the mailing list going on sort of all of this week, uh, if you're interested in that. Yes? Well, wouldn't one of the solutions be to pose Barbican for these, these consumers that don't want to deal with two projects? Just so you guys provide a host solution. Yeah, so so both IBM and Rackspace have hosted Barbican, and you can definitely use that. Uh, I don't know if anybody's mentioned that in the, in the thread. I think it's, it's worth mentioning. Um, but uh, yeah, there's that. Hopefully, in a, hopefully, in sometime in the future, people will, will adopt Barbican more, and it won't be such a pushback for, for integrating directly with it. Uh, and now it's time for that one. Okay. <laughs> I need to stop Uh, so 
9311 is the port that I've got uh, Barbican running in. Observation, by the way, this is, I did mention, this is just my local environment. <laughs> a, real, a real production barbecue would be running a, under a TLS uh, connection. <laughs> uh, and so, let me make sure. And let's send that. And when I get back to the secret reference, uh, should look pretty familiar if you're familiar with any open stack project. Uh, but that's the, the secret idea of the thing. Uh, that I just stored. And so to be able to then retrieve that, or sorry, if I want to look at metadata about my secret, there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, a lot of these things you can actually uh, uh, specify when you first create the secret. Uh, so stuff like the algorithm, here it's null uh, because I didn't specify it. Uh, but this is metadata that you could say, like, this is an, an AES key that I'm using at CPC mode. And, stuff like that. and all this stuff is immutable as well, so you're not going to be able to change. Once you set it? Ah, uh, yeah, that's an excellent yeah. point. So everything in bar, well, at least all the secrets in Barbican are immutable, right? So we don't want somebody to sneakily come, like, replace your encryption key from another URI, right? Like, when it comes time for you to rotate your encryption keys, the new key should be a new secret with a new URI. But the metadata is not immutable. The metadata is immutable. It's yeah, the not. secret itself is immutable. Once yeah. you store the secret, you can't like post a new a new key to the same resource. 
all this stuff as well, you won't be able to change like the status or uh, I mean the secret type. Updated will will change. So there's certain things that will change if you. So all of these are YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Once you set them, you can't change them. Um, uh, some other interesting bits here. Um, Creator ID, I, I believe this is the Keystone um, ID of the user that I created. Yeah, the user ID from Keystone. Um, we've also got uh, another interesting one here, the expiration. So I didn't set an expiration date for this, but uh, when you go to store the secret, you can set an expiration date. And after that date, then Barbican responds with port or not found. So effectively, your secret's gone from the, from the system. Um, was that intentional not to make it uh, like extendable, like um, exploration, for example? To to extend it, like yeah. oh crap, I meant to. No, yeah, no, not not right now. Um, but if you want to make that happen, sure. Now sure. sure. I was asking, like, so was sure. that design intention that you know from the beginning, make sure that the exploration there is not changeable? Is that uh, intentional or like it just happened? I think I, I don't think we purposely focused in on the expiration date. Per okay. se. Uh, I know for sure we did want to, to set a date after which you could get the secret back. Um, but I don't think we purposely made it immutable to, to protect our area. Um, anything else interesting from here? Uh, we did add a new feature last cycle uh, to add sort of user-defined metadata in a very similar way as the uh, Nova does. And so, actually, Fernando was the main contributor to that stuff. Uh, and that's available now. I don't have it in my demo, but, but it's there. Uh, this sort of supersedes a lot of these um, metadata items here. Uh, so if, if we ever do a V2 movies, we'll probably all go away and just use that user-defined metadata for that. Except for, like, you know, like create it or yeah. things uh, that Yeah. Also notice the actual secret data is not part of this JSON log. Uh, and so if you have that audit rule, like this is all you can get. So you could, you could go look like, oh yeah, there is a secret there. It's an AS key or whatever, uh, but I can't actually get it back. Uh, and so the content types, uh, like I mentioned earlier, content types is sort of a, a old way of doing stuff. Uh, what we originally envisioned is use the exact header to specify content types and get that stuff back. Uh, in practice, it was difficult, uh, mainly because like uh, stuff like uh, like Apache server is very finicky about like adding custom content types and stuff like that. Um, also, there was a lot a lot of confusion on how it was supposed to work. Uh, so what we're telling people now is instead of using that content type feature, just use slash payload, and that's how you get your secret back. Uh, so if you remember, that was the secret that we were storing. Have you guys ever looked at a certificate before? So this is what an RSA key looks like. Um, if I want to store, store this in Barbican, I can't actually just copy paste this into the JSON block. Does anybody know why? Like the formatting? It can have a double quote. Slash one. It can have a double quote. Double quote. Double quote. Yeah, it, it, there's yeah. a chance that one of these characters may be a double quote. That, yeah. That's well, possible. Case, yeah. Huh? It won't escape. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the, the main reason. It's supposed to be private. Yeah, the character. What's that? New line character. Yeah, they, we got a winner. 
new line character is an invalid JSON character. Oh. Unless you're unless you're going to yes, huh? unless, unless you're 16. <laughs> Yeah, unless you like is JSON escape it and stuff like that. But if you do that, then you actually end up modifying your RC key, right? You don't want to do that. Uh, so the way we get around that is that we, we allow people to base 64 encode their stuff before sending it to us. So you can use something like this uh, and get your private time right and get a big base 64 string out of it. Uh, and this is guaranteed to always have JSON acceptable characters. Uh, so that's what I pasted here. Let's zoom into that. So that big long string is what I have here for payload. The way that I tell Barbican, hey, by the way, this isn't really the C grid that I'm trying to store. It's the actual C grid is the base 64 decoded representation of that is with this portion here. When I'm telling, hey, by the way, my payload has been content encoded in base 64. So whenever whenever Barbican sees this as part of your post to create a new secret, it'll uh, it'll take that payload you sent it, base64 decoding first, and then store it in the secret store backend. Um, there's one more workflow we have. So so the base64 encoding the thing is not the only the only way to go about this. Uh, we also have uh, something we call a two-step code. And the way that works is you can just post an MP for as, as long as um, As long as it doesn't have a payload, right? You can you can send this to uh, uh, where's my token? Impossibly by space sixty four you get a reduced length secret, right? It's actually expands the oh, length of the secret, oh. yeah. Um, so if you got something really huge, Uh, so I've already created one of these here. Uh, 
server CSR. So this is a certificate request, very much like that private RSA key is going to be reliant and stuff like that. So this is something else we need to basically work code before we hand that to Barbican. Uh, last time we did this demo, somebody pointed out that there is no base 64 thing in the meta that tells Barbican to undo it. Uh, it's an inconsistency of the API, and I think it sucks. But it may, not, may or may not be, be too late to do that. Uh, but in our defense, uh, base 64 encoding does certificate requests is the only way to send a, a cert request to us. So, so there's that. Um, and so when you create the CSR, usually like using OpenSSL or whatever, they'll ask you like what's the domain name and like, what the certificate for and all those questions and stuff like that. And that's all contained in the string. Uh, so we said that um, just like before we need oh, the authentication. copy of your CSR there. Um, you're going to ask, isn't that bad to give out the CSR? There is no secret data in the CSR. Uh, the secret part is the key you use to sign the CSR. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's got time the order was created, the last time one of those workers updated it. Um, and then it's got a status. Now, uh, I don't have a CA hooked up to this, so that status is going to be pending forever. Uh, but this is normally like like the sort of the workflow for orders is you can do a get on this until you see that status turn active, and once the status turns to active, there's going to be uh, a secret a secret ref here or a container ref uh, rather, uh, and then if you if you then do a get on that container reference, then you'll get a container then that shows uh, secret references for all the different parts of the certificate you've got. Uh, and I think that's it for the demo. It almost seems though that you make, like again, I'm, I'm, I'm very great API based at uh, real uh, centric, but it almost seems that you might want to go from polling to maybe web hooking now. That maybe just when you're doing the entry for the certificate, you yeah, just say, pass it myself and notify me here when my certificate yeah. is done. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that would be possible. Um, Especially because it's mutable, so. Yeah, yeah. If, I if you wanted to go to that direction, I'd you don't want any, again, somebody just looking and looking. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good point. I don't think we've ever had like a like an architecture discussion where somebody brought up web hooks. Uh, I think it's interesting, but um, we don't support it as a set. How would that feel sort in the database? database administrator had access to the secret so, uh, That's an excellent question. How is the payload actually stored in the database? Uh, it depends on what plugin you chose for your secret storage. Um, the, the plugin that we use at Rackspace is the database adapter with a PKCS11, um, which then talks to an HSN. So we have a master encryption key that, that is made in the HSN and never leaves the HSN. So when, when you send a certificate with your payload, uh, the API will take that payload and then uh, first it'll look up to see if you have, if you've used the system before. So the first time you use the system, we generate what we call the project encryption key or the PK or the, or the I forget what, it, what, what we call it in the code. Uh, but basically, it's a, it's a double encryption, right? So each project gets their own encryption key. And uh, the workflow is, so the first time you try to store something, uh, you won't have a project key, so then we tell the HSM, hey, generate a project key, wrap it in a master key, and return that encrypted blob to me. And we store that encrypted blob in the database as your project key. Uh, when you send data then, or as part of the first request, we then take that, that encrypted project key. I, I, we probably cache it the first time around for, for performance, but uh, 
basically any subsequent request where you're submitting data, we take that encrypted block from the key and we send it to the HSM and say, hey, HSM, unwrap this and keep the key in memory. And that gives us a handle to the in-memory key. And then we take your data and send it to the HSM and say, like, using this key that you have in memory, wrap the secret. And then it returns the encrypted block and that's what we store in the database. Uh, and that's how we, it, it's, the reason we have to do that, it's a lot of hops back and forth to the HSM, but that's what bought us the unlimited storage, basically. Uh, if you use the KMIP device, uh, the KMIP device doesn't use the database adapter. It, it just acts as the secret store directly. So there is no, there is no concept of a project key. Mm -hmm. Just as your secret comes in, then it goes straight into the HSM. And then the HSM handle is what we store in the database as a representation of your secret. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not super familiar with doc tags, so I'm not sure how the doc tag plugin does it. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's the secret of life? <laughs> Aliens. <laughs> well, secret of the sword and bark. <laughs> I, have, I have kind of a broad question. Uh, you know, with the different projects, there tends to be corporate entities that develop plugins that, that work with them, like Neutron is really popular. Everybody wants to have a plugin for that. You'd mentioned Symantec. Um, are you working with any other companies that have shown interest in, in Barbican as, as far as in enhancing or their products? So our, let's see, I'm going to answer this. Uh, uh, part of our core team, we have uh, a lot of companies that are involved. Uh, I think we do have the company diversity maturity badge at the maturity badge showcase. Uh, have you guys seen that? Every project has like a, like a maturity oh, level yeah, yeah, assigned yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you meet certain goals, then they increase that, that thing for you. And one of those goals is what they call company diversity, right? And so we do meet that goal in that we have contributors from many companies uh, that are contributing to Barbican. Uh, as far as like very company specific plugins and stuff like that, uh, we were talking to Digicert for a while. Uh, they were interested in, in providing a plugin, but uh, the guy I was working with them sort of went in my name. So I, I'm not sure what happened with that. Uh, Semantic is the only certificate authority that is actively working with us now. Um, as far as the secret store part of it, uh, for those kind of plugins, what, what we're doing is we're using um, standards that are already defined. And so then those aren't company specific, right? Like we happen to use SafeNet Lunas for HSM, but in theory, the plugin we wrote should work with any HSM by any vendor as long as they, uh, they conform to that published specification. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah? Awesome. That guy, some guy was walking by here and he looked at that and he said, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. How many people from the NSA are on your team? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, that I'm aware of, none of our contributors. Uh, there is a guy that sits in our sessions every single summit. Uh, and somebody introduced me to him like one time. And you guys seem like a cool guy. He's got like blue hair, all like shaped the side of his head. Oh. And hair all down the side. I'm like, yes, oh. looks like a cool guy. I know that guy. Uh, uh, yeah, so he's like, hey, you know, what, how's it going or whatever? I just want to introduce myself and, and whatnot. I'm like, hey, nice to meet you. You know, I work at Raxi. It's really cool. It's like NSA. <laughs> this is the end of this conversation. It was nice to meet you. I have to go now. He's <laughs> keynoted before. Did he really? Yeah. He's, We're keeping an eye on you, buddy. <laughs> I guarantee I'm on the list, um, some list, so. uh, probably not for this, but I, I have spoken about GPG encryption a lot to different security conferences that I should have had there on. I'll see the FBI is going to be asking you to unlock somebody's cloud. Right. <laughs> they can go talk to a zero game vendor for that. We're not going to do it. I guess you could do the message encryption with this, right? Like you could create a chat, uh, Barbie Cam chat on top of this? Yeah, so actually Fernando did a really cool demo last month for the Python group. Yeah, it was uh, using, so you can actually uh, use Barbican to encrypt your, your Twitter tweets. So I made like a little web app where you just have like a little text box, you type in like whatever, you know, I'm a dog, blah, 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 
press go, and then it encrypts it using Barbican, using encryption key in Barbican, and then post it to Twitter. So, so that anyone, no one will be able to read your message on Twitter unless <laughs> they you know, put it back. We must, uh, we, we must have had, so part of the, the group of guys that started Barbican in Rackspace uh, many years ago, like three years ago now, uh, we sort of envisioned a bunch of other companion, I guess, package projects that, that would go along with it nicely. Uh, a lot of stuff just made for like really cool ideas we thought were cool. Um, there's one that, that somewhat, that actually has been worked on, uh, it's a project called Stockade. And we we're trying to make a Django web app whereby you could share um, credentials with people in your organization, all backed by Barbican. And so you would log into this, like, you know, it's just a web app, you would log in. Uh, if anybody's worked at Rackspace, it's basically password safe, but by Barbican. Uh, but it's a web app where like your team would sort of subscribe to like a little team space and that's where you would store like database credentials for the project you're working on or whatever. Uh, and our web app would like store them in Barbican and then when somebody else logs in and needs to retrieve them, it would retrieve them Barbican. So you can do stuff like that. Uh, another thing that we have thought about that would be really cool um, would be to put like a, like a, build like a, like a fused file system that, that mounts stuff uh, from Barbican, right? So you could provide secrets for like old like legacy apps that just look in like a config file for a password, right? Uh, but mount that in an in-memory file system that's backed by Barbican so that when you when the app like reads the file, really what's going on in the background is something that's going up to Barbican and fetch that credential and then building that file and moving to the app. Uh, and I thought that was awesome, but we have never gotten a chance to actually work on that. Uh, it's just like a really cool idea that, that I wish we could do. Uh, so it, yeah, there's definitely a lot of, of cool things I think you could do uh, where, where you just sort of forget about the problem of how do I store this stuff securely? Well, I'll just defer all that to bargain. The only thing I have to worry about now is how do I store my keystone credentials securely? Which is sort of the, the Achilles heel that a bar again, it's still, because we defer everything to Keystone, you still get the problem of how do I protect my Keystone production. Yeah. How about that? storing some type of scripting, like ActiveX thing, and the Azure payload, and then you're on Internet Explorer, and then it does something <laughs> weird. <laughs> Somebody actually reported a cross-site spreading yeah. vulnerability in our API. I'm like, that's XSS on the rest of the API. But, uh, <laughs> might work, I guess. Mm. Any other questions, guys?